Instead of saying, God wouldn't give you more than you could handle, you could say, why don't I come over and help you with the laundry? So begins an article entitled, Stupid Phrases for People in Crisis. In addition to the ever popular more than you can handle phrase, the author lists statements we often say when we encounter friends in crisis, consolations that fall flat in the face of human pain. Things like, it gets better. Or when God shuts a door, he opens a window. Did you pray about it? And this is my personal favorite. I love to hear this. When I think about your situation, I'm reminded of how blessed I really am. <laughs> we mean to help, but so often our efforts fall flat and worse sometimes when we see friends in crisis, we add to the pain. This morning, our lectionary takes us back to the book of Job, a little book of Hebrew poetry in our Old Testament. We're in a four-week series called Losing My Religion. We're following the mythical figure of Job who lost everything and grappled so profoundly with the question of suffering. Last week, we talked about the invitation to cultivate a disinterested faith, to reject that idea that there's a cosmic equation that tells us if we're good, good things will happen to us. And if we do bad things, well, we're going to pay the price. We have to reject that equation as Job did, because when he looked around at the human experience, and when we look around at the human experience, that's just not the way things work, is it? Good people suffer unjustly and a lot of really bad people live really great lives. When we encounter our friend Job today, he's in worse shape than he was last week. Attacked on all sides by even more trouble, Job's three friends come to visit him, to console him as he sits on all he has left in the world, a pile of ashes, and scrapes at the painful boils that cover his body from head to toe. His three lifelong friends, like brothers, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, come to sit with Job and to hear his lament. You might guess what happened. They showed their true colors by offering advice like, well, Job, you say you haven't done anything bad, but really, would something this terrible happen to anyone who hadn't done something bad? Why don't you think a little harder? Their presence adds to Job's suffering, and he laments in chapter 6, when desperate people give up on God Almighty, their friends at least should stick with them, but my brothers are as fickle as a gulch in the desert. One day they're gushing with water from melting ice and snow cascading out of the mountains, but by midsummer they're dry dry gullies baked in the sun, and travelers who spot them go out of their way for a drink, and they end up in a waterless gulch, and they die of thirst. We come into this morning's story during a loud lament. Job is sick and tired of listening to his friends, and he feels sure that if only he could express himself to God, God would address his situation. He would get justice, but... God is nowhere to be found, silent, silent as an abandoned house, painfully, retchingly silent. Oh, how I wish I could find him. If only I could find him, I would tell him how wrong all of this is. I would beg him to see my perspective, to fix my pain, and he would. It's not that Job is confused about what he thinks about his situation. Here in chapter 3, he lays his case out plainly. The problem is he can't seem to get a hold of God. He can't find God in order to even get an audience for his case. He can't locate the divine. Riotous pain, horrible loss, and all he gets in return to his pleading is silence. 
As his friends show their true colors with their not so helpful advice, Job is beginning to think that he's seeing God for who God really is too. Absent, silent, nowhere to be found. Does God even exist at all? Our every man Job is living questions that all of us have lived at one time or another on this journey of life. There have been moments for each of us when we have longed to get a hold of God just so we could ask our questions. But all we see when we look out is an empty abyss. You know, Thomas Merton wrote, if you find God with ease, perhaps it is not God you have found. So I got to wondering, what if what Job experienced as God's silence, what we experience as God's silence, is not really absence as it feels to us, but actually God's way of communicating presence and power, giving us the opportunity to sort through our pain and to learn again the faithfulness of God. After all, a God who came every time you and I called would get old really fast. If we were able to snap our fingers and make God materialize like a genie in a bottle, what kind of God would we have? We would have a God who was powerless, subject to our whims, a God with no meaningful ability to change anything. I recall one Christmas when I was about five years old, I wished and wished and wished for this special doll I'd seen on TV that you could actually feed. It came with all the baby utensils and these cute little packets of food that you mix with water and feed to the baby. I must have had great hopes for the toy because I'm the old, eldest of five and I observed my mother feeding the real babies in our household, my sisters and brothers. I thought it would be so great to have my very own baby to feed. Well, Christmas morning arrived and sure enough, under the tree was the doll I had wished for, brightly packaged with all the baby food she could possibly need. I was so happy. I fed that baby. I fed it and fed it and fed it and fed it all day long. In fact, I fed the baby so much that I used up the entire supply of food in one day. <laughs> and do you know that that baby just sat there and ate every bit of food that I stuffed in its plastic mouth? The baby didn't protest at all, didn't act full, didn't cry, didn't get antsy, just ate and ate and ate whatever I wanted. And well, when all the food was gone, that was it for me. I can't remember ever playing with that doll again. She had lost her power to engage me. I kind of think that would be the way we would perceive God if God showed up every time we called. If we could control God, if we could tell God what to do, if we could make God suddenly appear, well, that would be no relationship at all, would it? Perhaps the silence of God is not really the absence of God. Perhaps what Job needed and what we need from time to time is an opportunity to express, to voice our sorrow and pain and hopelessness to God, not so that God will know how we feel, God already knows, but so that we can begin to understand our role in relationship to God and so that we can realize finally that we are not in control and that God is not some divine bellboy who comes every time we ring. God's silence is kind of a presence. Silence in a strange way offers us the opportunity to remind each other what we believe. Silence allows us to listen to ourselves, to hear our own arguments, to tire of our control, and to ultimately surrender to God. So how do we go about living with hope, living with the expectation of God's answer, even when we can't seem to hear anything? Well, that's where you come in. Every one of you. Job didn't have a community of people who helped him remember that God was there even when he wasn't receiving an answer to his questions. All the people around him just 
added to his pain. None of them held up a banner of hope for Job. In his darkest, most quiet and retching moments, Job didn't have loving voices surrounding him, reminding him of God's everlasting love. When God is silent, when my heart is aching because I cannot hear a word of comfort or direction from God, I need you. I need all of you to remind me that God's silence does not mean that God is absent. I need your voices to remind me and to hold me accountable when I begin to buy into the falsehood that God should be available to me whenever I snap my fingers. The church represents over 2,000 years of people who, embracing their questions, have offered them back to God over and over again until the cacophony of our voices together blends into a beautiful confession. We call each other to remember over and over again that God is here, that God is loving, and that there is never a time when God has abandoned us. One of the greatest modern thinkers on the absence of God is Nobel Prize winning author Elie Wiesel. His life is a story of listening for God, of finding nothing but silence, of losing his faith, and of slowly making his way back to faith. Surrounded by people who, even in the midst of horror and suffering, affirmed that God was alive, that God was listening, that God was there. When Elie Wiesel was 14 years old, Nazi soldiers took him and his family, crammed them into a railroad car, separated men from women, boys went with their fathers, girls went with their mothers, families were divided never to see each other again. Freedom disappeared and night came. Even the days were covered with darkness. God appeared to be absent. Wiesel's family was killed, and slowly, Elie Wiesel's faith died, too. By age 15, Elie Wiesel began to pray regularly Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? Wiesel's book, Night, tells of his journey of faith through the dark night of the soul, in one memory, he recalls celebrating Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, in the concentration camp where he was held. The leader would cry out, blessed be the eternal, blessed be the name of the eternal. And Wiesel would think, why? Why should we bless him? He could only think of all the misery and pain and death that surrounded him and wonder, where was God? But still, he heard all around him voices rising. All the earth and the universe are God's. All creation bears witness to the greatness of God. And even as his faith was slowly dying, we still heard the voices of those who refused to believe that God was absent or impotent. At age 15, he heard these proclamations of faith and they followed him through his life, all the way through utter despair and disbelief, again, finally back to faith. The faith of those around him carried him through. At age 16, Elie Wiesel was liberated. Eventually, he came to this country to live and in 1986, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. In his speech accepting that honor, he affirmed strong faith in God. Listen to these words of faith coming from the heart of someone who had suffered profoundly, doubted the existence, never mind the goodness of God, and yet emerged with hope. Words of gratitude. First to our common creator, this is what the Jewish tradition commands us to do. At special occasions, one is duty-bound to recite the following prayer. Blessed be thou for having sustained us to this day. I remember it happened yesterday or eternities ago. A young Jewish boy discovered the kingdom of night. 
I remember his bewilderment. I remember his anguish. It happened so fast. The ghetto, the deportation, the sealed cattle car, the fiery altar on which the history of our people and the future of mankind were meant to be sacrificed. It is in his name that I speak to you and express to you my deepest gratitude as one who has emerged from the kingdom of night. We know that every moment is a moment of grace, every hour an offering. Not to share them would mean to betray them. For Elie Wiesel, sharing in suffering reminded him that God was never truly absent, that God's silence is not God's absence. Friends, God is with us, as God was with Job and with Elie Wiesel, even when we cannot hear an answer from God. And when God seems absent, when all we can see around us is a yawning abyss, we can look to our right and look to our left, and we can see lives of experience and faith, a whole community of living and breathing ambassadors of God's grace. All around you are people who will touch a hand, wipe a tear, remind us that we are not alone. Our community, this community, will show true colors of perseverance and presence. We'll be true friends who abandon trite phrases, who pick up the overflowing laundry basket, and who wait with us until we remember that God will never leave us. And for this we say, thanks be to God. Amen.